So, good uh, morning. Today, our topic differs slightly to what we saw yesterday because now we're turning our minds to social media networks. So, we'll have a brief introductory remark and then we'll uh, listen to the speakers, the people who are on the rostrum now are well known because uh, I think you've seen their, their CVs. Suffice to say, perhaps I can give the speaking order. First, we're going to hear from Jason. After my introductory remark, he, 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 he has established Getter. Is that how it's pronou pronounced? Okay, lovely. Uh, it's a conservative a platform that is rejecting censorship. And then we'll have a debate because not everybody agrees with that. Then we'll hear from uh, Fabrice Fries. Do we say Fries or Free? Fries, I do apologize, I've mispronounced your name. Okay, uh, who is CEO of, of the French uh, press agency, who's just written a, a book. You sent it to me, and my thanks to you. Uh, that helped me know ahead of time your, what you think about certain matters. A differing view, no doubt, to Jason. And then Richard uh, Moniteur. We spoke over the phone, but we hadn't really met. He is an investigative journalist in a number of American uh, media outlets. And then we have, lastly, Jacob Siegel, hello, um, who uh, is um, a uh, editor at Tablet. We spoke over the phone, but we hadn't met in the flesh. So, all right then, perhaps I can just provide some introductory remarks to our discussion going to these networks and to speak about the political problems thrown up by these networks, and in particular in respect of democracy, because at the end of the day, our topic gravitates around that very point, democracy. So it strikes me that these networks are, one way or another, dismantling democracy such as we know it, which is a source of concern, and I think it, it needs to prompt debate. Liberal democracy, no doubt, will change its nature giving different forms of democracy as yet unknown or might open up to different political regimes, which might not be desirable, but at least we need to see what's going on. We can describe these networks as a sort of a cafe culture um, because basically an amateur is king. Everybody speaks and everybody can be heard, irrespective of the quality of what they say. It's broadcast everywhere. Of course, as you can imagine, it's difficult to uh, have a coup d'etat in, in, in a cafe. There's only uh, four of them. But in, with lightning speed, you can generate vast discontent over a massive platform. You, can see, you all know how it works. And the amateurs that are speaking, so they are amateurs, they're not professionals, they're amateurs, uh, is not only listened to, but becomes extremely influential and powerful. In other words... In the 21st century, thanks to these networks, we're going to see a, a mass phenomenon which is going to change everything. So I think we need to remember that according to uh, Proclus' tradition, Pythagoras' disciples uh, divulged the secret of irrational numbers. Now, having done that, which was forbidden by Pythagoras in particular, they were punished by drowning in a, uh, and they died because the shapeless and the unexpressible must always be kept secret. Now, some obviously uh, rulers keep information to themselves and of course we all know that knowledge is power, information is power. The very first time information that was beforehand held by uh, our rulers are now in the public fora. Remember Midgate of 2009. So we can imagine uh, the happiness of numerous people who are powerless and are, don't have any prospect of having any power and all of a sudden they can challenge uh, 
the ruling classes, even though, of course, they can't topple them and replace them. And that's probably also what it's all about. So it's not direct power, it's threat, it's influence, it's wielding intimidation, it's harassment uh, directed against rulers. And of course, this is a source of, of worry for these latter. Obviously, in uh, democracy, it's serious because democracy rests on people's opinions. But it's also true in, or in autocrats uh, or despotic regimes. I'm not, not wagging my finger at anybody, but look at China, Cuba, Vietnam networks are characterized as the enemy. And when uh, they can, they are uh, muzzled. But, you know, networks are like water. They go everywhere, whatever you do. You know, uh, what uh, a flood does, it goes everywhere. Power, if you like, established power can send uh, an enemy into prison, but it can never obtain silence because these networks are like water. They go everywhere. In other words, even authoritarian regimes need to take on board the opinion of people. And as we know, Alan said, uh, no power has ever uh, taken on public opinion. So we can see a huge amount of contradictions uh, uh, being abundant because information is no longer ranked. Uh, um, okay, rulers uh, have the, the privilege of information. Uh, it wasn't like that in the past anyway, and they choose what information goes out. But now information is splurted everywhere. They're thrown in the face of, of people who don't know how to rank and select information. Look at the pandemic. Information was wandering everywhere, and public opinion, obviously, never it was, it was very difficult for people to select what was important or not. Hence, a lack of confidence. I mean, contradictory information uh, just was, was was splurged out into the into the public arena, and amateurs, as we are, can't rank appropriately this information. It's multiple; uh, it shows black and white, uh, and sits in contradiction with it, with it, with itself. And users of these platforms uh, uh, take hold of this information based on their own bias. Uh, beliefs, whatever. So the information doesn't provide truth, it uh, cements prejudice and belief. In other words, information that are, that are given out by the rulers are, on, are just on the same, on a par, if you will, as any old information thrown out by anybody. So elites no longer have the monopoly of information, and so they lose their authority. Why? Well, because a legitimate authority is legitimate if it provides certainty in, in terms of symbolic security. So the very foundation that is now crumbling is the legitimacy, uh, the very legitimacy of power. Power can only hold authority if its orders are just and accurate. And that only can rest on the quality of the information that the rulers have. So. Uh, authority is likely, therefore, to lose its authority if everything else isn't where it should be. So uh, power bases and rulers will be f will feel harassed because the slightest thing they say may be challenged. And so our political figures are uh, dragged uh, dragged into the public forum to say rather watered down, insipid uh, statements. So to round off, these uh, platforms talk about revolt and anger. And these, these rebellion movements, which are erratic uh, and eclectic, they have no specific purpose. Even though the rulers were to uh, pick up on their concerns, they wouldn't calm down. Remember the Yellow Vests. Uh, it is a destructive power, uh, but they have no manifesto. They have no leader, uh, you know, the people on these platforms. Martin Curie in the United States has just written a very interesting book two years back on this very point. We can talk about nihilism or even an anarchism. In other words, democracy it would be substituted by an endless uh, protestation, a sort of a chaos at the end of the day, a constant agitation without any manifesto, without any network. It's pretty much like a game, a game. You know, a person operating on these platforms is always against. So, obviously, uh, the anger of some quarters of the of population is nothing new, but it can make itself heard thanks to these uh, networks propagating 
it, his voice and these platforms are anti-system by very principle. So it's difficult to know really what's going on. Democratic, liberal democratic institutions has had enough. Parties and, and, and the media are threatened by these networks. It's possible also that these networks end up by uh, setting up uh, the myth of the platonic uh, governance technocrats, for example. Uh, that wouldn't be too much of a problem for me. The rule of the experts. Are other forms of legitimacy going to appear? We don't know. But we do know is that our institutions are going to suffer radical transformation. Let me round off by saying that an idea is being propagated according to which we may see a democracy which represents emotions. I don't think that's possible. Demo a democracy doesn't represent emotions. Um, it's not there to pick up on uh, emotions. I mean, a, a, a head of state is not a psychoanalyst. Or maybe a despotic a government could be a psychoanalytic psycho um, person. A democracy needs to lay out a project, a plan, a collective direction. And when you have a party whose name is uh, expressing concern, like uh, the rebellious French, Les Fran La France Insoumise, uh, then obviously this can uh, produce uh, certain problems. In other words, I think we need to take into consideration these concerns, but they need to be turned into a democratic project. Otherwise, a dem the democracy may uh, be battered. Now, I want to finish on this point because I don't want to steal thunder from uh, the people on the rostrum who've been good enough to contribute to this panel. Let me hand over straight away to Jason Miller. Thank you. And thank you, Chantal, very much for your brilliant opening, although I would be remiss if I didn't point out that professionals built the Titanic and it was amateurs who built Noah's Ark. So I'll give a little bit of, little bit of defense to the, uh, the rabble rousers. Um, uh, Jason Miller had a chance to speak with many of you yesterday a little, in a very spirited political conversation. Today I'm here as the CEO of Getter, the new social media platform that I founded on July 4th. And uh, to the other point that Chantal was talking about, I am actually here to talk about something that we can do. Not necessarily that it's something that we're against, but something that we can be for. And I fundamentally believe that our freedom of speech rights, not just in the United States, not just in France, but around the world, are under assault. Much of this stems from the debate we had yesterday about people being angry, people being frustrated, the opportunity gap that I spoke of. And what I said is that if people are not allowed to have their voice, if they're marginalized, if they're pushed into a corner, uh, it doesn't matter if they're on the left or if they're on the right, they're going to become radicalized. Once an idea takes hold, if people can't express themselves and be part of the conversation, I think that's a dangerous precedent for society. So how did Getter come about? Why did someone who formerly was President Trump's spokesperson and senior advisor take to the social media field? And that's because over this last year, I saw what I described in the United States as being the single worst year for censorship in American history. And you look back at the beginning of last year as COVID started to rage and people were being censored or deplatformed or shadow banned on social media platforms for daring to say something as ostentatious as the virus came from a lab in Wuhan. Now, spoiler, it did. Uh, I don't know if it was man-made or if it was just traipsed out uh, by a lazy lab worker, but the fact of the matter is COVID came from a lab in Wuhan and people were being told you're not allowed to say that. That's politically incorrect. How dare you? Or then as we moved into the summer for people who dared to criticize his Lord and Savior, Dr. Anthony Fauci, people were being censored and deplatformed and shadow banned, which by the way, if Dr. Fauci was here right now seeing the lack of masks, he might have a heart attack. His head would explode, uh, I, I think, instantaneously. Um, <laughs> no, no. Uh, or, or he might point out and say it looks like President Obama's birthday party in Martha's Vineyard where no one wore a mask either. Um, but, the, but then as we moved into the fall, it became a bit more serious. And uh, obviously I was working for President Trump and so I had a, a clear bias in this. But as we got into the, uh, not just the warning labels that we put on post, uh, which I think is a big infringement on speech, 
Um, but then as we got into the Hunter Biden scandal. Now, if people are wondering what that is, I won't go and bore you with a big political debate, but there was an issue where Hunter Biden, son of President Joe Biden, had a laptop that showed that he dropped off at a computer store and forgot, had all sorts of information about the family business dealings. Why does this matter? Because after the, because uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, and the mainstream media colluded to say you can't share this information. Literally, just a matter of just weeks before an election, a close American election, big tech said, nope, you can't share this story. They would allow uh, rogue actors like Adam Schiff, the Democrat on Capitol Hill, to say this is Russian disinformation. Well, fast forward again, and it turns out not only was the, the laptop real, but in the post-election survey, one out of every six Biden voters said they would reconsider their vote if they knew about the alleged foreign dealings of the Biden family and other concerns. And so this is a big issue, but uh, I, I just want to put a pin in this for a moment, that we literally have our big tech companies starting to play judge, jury, and executioner with our free speech rights. I think that's wrong. Of course, then there was the deplatforming, the complete deplatforming and removal of President Trump's First Amendment rights following January 6th. And so then is the spring, as I started uh, still working for President Trump, and I saw a number of these platforms come forward with their uh, the different ideas and trying to get him on. I became aware of the people working on Getter, and I said, this is the ticket. This is the, this is the platform that I want to be a part of. And so I want to tell you a little bit about what we're for, what we're trying to do, and how I think this impacts uh, the rest of the world on the social media front. I think in many ways, social media, uh, too many platforms, it's become a big cesspool. I know when I open up Twitter in the morning, or I even, um, I still look at Facebook so I can communicate with my, with my parents and with my aunts. Uh, I'm not sure what else Facebook is used for, but that's typically what I use it for. Um, Instagram is great so I can stay in touch with my 20-something uh, colleagues, uh, understand uh, what they might be up to. Uh, but Twitter has really just become a cesspool, and it's all negativity. Everything is, is bad, and it's mean, and it's horrible. So I want to make social media fun again. I do think that that is possible. And our fundamental belief, and this is what absolutely enrages uh, the political left, is that we believe in free speech. We oppose cancel culture. But we are, our value proposition here is that we never censor or deplatform people for their political opinions. But what really enrages the left is we actually have a moderation standard. We have a proactive and a robust moderation platform where our terms of service say you cannot have, uh, whether it be pornography or violent imagery or um, uh, racial or religious epithets. Uh, that's not free speech, much in the same way that you can't, uh, if you were to walk into a pub and start hurling racial epithets, uh, there are going to be ramifications, uh, probably a knuckle sandwich, uh, depending on what part of the world that you're in. Um, but just in the same way, you can't go into the digital town square and act like a complete jerk uh, for to, to be applied about it. So we do have terms of service. We do make sure that these things uh, are not existent on our platform. Uh, we work with both artificial intelligence and with human moderators to make sure this is possible. But the key, and I want to go back to this, uh, Chantal, and what we can do, what is possible, we have to have that safe space, that venue for people to be able to communicate their political beliefs. And I, I know I uh, made the joke about the Titanic and Noah's Ark as far as amateurs and the professionals, but there does need to be a challenging even when it comes to science. So I'm someone who's vaccinated. I tell everyone I know to go and get vaccinated. I make no bones about that. That's popular in some parts, not popular in others, but that's my belief. But I do think that certain aspects of the science need to be challenged. Let me give you an example. It was as late as February 29th of last year that Dr. Fauci uh, was saying, um, don't wear a mask. You don't need to. It's not going to be a big deal. Then became one mask, then became two masks, then became the entire box of masks. Then we didn't have to wear a mask again, and now it's back to one mask. On a very serious note, why is not the regulation when you go through the airport to wear multiple masks? Now, again, I'm someone who's vaccinated. I'm not saying that all, all masks are terrible. I'm saying that they're. Um, uh, I'm saying that they're. We should be challenging the assertions. I think of some of the issues such as science to make sure that we're getting it right. Uh, I was very proud of the vaccine that President Trump helped develop as part of Operation Warp Speed. Actually, there are multiple vaccines. But also, and again, by no means am I uh, a science expert. There are plenty of people here who can go and speak to that a little more eloquently. Uh, I remember last fall was once you get the jab, then you're going to be fine. Now we're told you need multiple jabs. One researcher in Sweden even recently said you need as many as five jabs. 
and so when we talk about somebody being vaccinated, what is fully vaccinated if you're getting vaccinated in perpetuity? So the point being, not here to debate about vaccines. Like I said, I've been vaccinated. I tell people to get it. But the issue is I do think we need to have forums for people to be able to express their political beliefs and to challenge the status quo. This has always been what set us apart as a democracy, uh, the broader the West is democracy, from the uh, countries such as China or Russia or these dictatorships where only certain political thought is, actually, is absolutely allowed. I had my own, I'll kind of wrap up my own experience with free speech in Brazil a week or so ago, which some of you may or may not have seen, where I um, uh, attended a uh, political conference, uh, not much uh, different from this, although much more festive. It was in Brazil, so everybody was dancing and having fun, and um, I speak zero Portuguese, so I'm much in the same way I speak pretty much zero French. But the as I was leaving the country, um, went through security, and there were a number of plainclothes police officers that said, Mr. Miller, will you please come with us? And so they took me down the escalator and into a room, um, and they said, we have a Supreme Court order here from Alexander de Moraes, who's one of the Supreme Court justices of Brazil. Now, if you've never heard of Mr. de Moraes, don't worry, I'd never heard of him either up until a week or so ago. He very much looks like a Bond villain. He looks kind of like Blofeld. Um, Blofeld might be a little bit more attractive, though. Um, and they said that, well, Mr. Miller, we need to ask you questions before you can leave Brazil. I'm like, oh, okay, well, what's it about? Um, am, I, am I being arrested or accused of any wrongdoing? They said no. I go, oh, can I leave? And they said no, okay. So I guess I am being held. I go, oh, what's this about? And they said, well, we have two secret investigations that are going on. I said, okay, um, can you tell me what they're about? And they said, no, they're secret, okay. So, and again, I was invited to speak for a political action conference. That's all it was. And they, they waited, even though the, the piece of paper was dated August 20th, they waited until it left just because they didn't want to have another free speech advocate in the country promoting the ideals. And one of the things that I learned is that in the U.S., we take for granted our freedom of speech rights. It's our First Amendment. It's one of our, literally one of our most cherished rights as Americans. A lot of countries don't have their own freedom of speech. And you take that for granted, just how important that is, how quickly that can be removed and taken away from you. Um, and in fact, I met the congresswoman in Brazil who's working to uh, develop their own, uh, essentially, First Amendment. Um, but it, as we learned, the thing that I, I was really thinking, though, is I was sitting in my detention room in, uh, in Brazil, uh, which, by the way, we got 100,000 new followers from Brazil just for my three hours of sitting there, which I've said if I knew I was going to get 100,000 followers for sitting for three hours, I would have stayed for six. Um, but what I realized is uh, I could call the embassy. I could call, I'll wrap up here, uh, I, I could call an embassy. I could call a lawyer. But if you were a citizen of Brazil, who would you call when your free speech rights are being taken away like this? I think this is an existential threat, not just to the United States, but to Western democracy. And I'm going to always fight for free speech rights. And I think that there is something positive to talk about. Thank you. Merci, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so you're not talking, you're not really talking about uh, being against censorship because y y you can't just let anybody uh, write anything. I mean, you said so yourself. So the question is, what are the criteria for censorship? Uh, and there need to there need to be another uh, media, and there needs to be another type of censorship. You're not against censorship in general because you, you mentioned that you have rules of service, and of course uh, you can't create a social media and just let people say whatever they want, uh, because it could become um, it would become a, a septic tank. And so when you say a uh, question needs to be called, uh, science needs to be called into the question. I believe it's best done by scientists. What you're describing is exactly what I said previously. If everybody starts calling into question science, and that's what happened during the pandemic, then we don't know where we're going, right? Uh, leave it to scientists to call into question science. Quickly, I'd push back on this point and say that uh, the scientists aren't always right. And when we talk about what are kind of the, the standards yes, or the ground rules, uh, typically free speech, your free speech rights extend yeah. up until the point where they infringe on someone else's free speech rights. Or just in the same way that, uh, like I said before, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, when you start to advocate illegal activity, that's not getting into free speech. But I think that you can have a platform, you can have uh, support free speech, oppose cancel culture, 
while making sure that you don't have the illegal activity or that you're infringing on on other people. And I, so I, to me, uh, and look, I will tell you that it's uh, I spent a lot of time on moderation and on this issue because as an advocate for free speech and so when it goes through this, there are always details that pop up or situations that pop up that you can't uh, um, fully predict. Uh, are we going to get it right 100% of the time? No, and quite frankly, if we did get it 100, right 100% of the time, people would say, who are you to be all of a sudden the, uh, the arbiter of what is free speech and what's not free speech? But our goal, our yeah. North Star, uh, and this is a point to the, the raison d'etre that the, our CEO friend um, uh, mentioned a few moments ago, is to make sure that you have this place where people will never be deplatformed for expressing their political beliefs. I think that's critical because it's not the case anymore on Twitter or Facebook or the other social media giants where you have the labels that are slapped on things or told that this is fake Mais, news. Je crois que, oui. and, and it's, uh, but who is, who is watching the watchman? Nous avons bien compris. Merci beaucoup. Je... Very well understood. Thank you. So now I'd like to pass the floor, uh, the, the mic to Fabrice. Uh, I would love to answer point by point what I've just heard. I'm boiling here on my seat, but I've understood uh, that you would like me to give a more general uh, introduction. So w what are we talking about today? It's democracy, and it's been clearly established uh, that today um, there's a lot of uh, scientific facts and other facts that are contested. Um, disinformation is a trend that is overwhelming us. Uh, I'm not a philosopher. I am a um, company CEO, and I'm going to tell you what my company does uh, in the midst of all of this. And uh, so I'm at the head of Agence uh, France, Presse, which, uh, France Presse, which is one of the leading uh, press agencies next to Reuters, uh, amongst others. And our role is twofold. Our raison d'etre, our reason for being, it didn't take us a year and a half to define it. It's been established under law. We are, it is our responsibility to tell the facts uh, uh, in an objective manner. That's perhaps a bit objective, but with as much honesty as possible worldwide through text, uh, images, and videos. And that is um, our job, our profession. And in order to do this, we have a network of journalists uh, worldwide, even in the most uh, uh, tense areas of the planet. Um, for example, when the Taliban's uh, entered uh, Kabul, we had 13 people at our desk in Kabul, and we had the Afghans uh, leave the desk, um, and we kept uh, the non-Afghans, and so we still have about a dozen people in Kabul. So in the current maelstrom, uh, our role is to try to convey the facts. We don't comment, we don't do editorials, and we try to deliver facts, current events, to the media, to the press, uh, to TV stations, to radio stations, and to information uh, websites. And I hope yours as well in, in the future. I hope that you will subscribe to uh, the AFP, to Agence France Presse, and I'm sure it'll be very useful for all of your readers. Get a getter account. Uh, great, <laughs> great. We'll trade. Okay. Uh, and the so the second, uh, my second point that I'd like to make, and I think you know what IFP does, but as of recently, we've become a key player in the fight against dis disinformation. This is a recent uh, action. Uh, press agencies, of course, well, our, our core role is to check, to fact check, uh, but that's very, Actually, no, we need to verify that what we say is right, but it's not the same thing as fact-checking. So for fast-checking, they're very um, sophisticated procedures. Um, and so, um, you know, fact-checking is uh, when uh, third parties publish something, and it happens after uh, checking, whereas at a press agency, information is checked before it's published. So there's a distinct distinction between fact-checking and checking information before it's published. Sometimes people tell us, you've always fought against disinformation at AFP, but that's not quite what's happened. There's been a change in terms of the stance that uh, the media have uh, adopted. Uh, AFP has never been interested in fake information. 
because uh, we felt like we had um, a lot on our plate already in terms of describing what was happening around the world in a factual manner. And up until recently, uh, you know, we, we, well, we've never been in the, we've never relayed rumors. Here's an example that's well known within AFP. When bin Laden, bin Laden was killed uh, by the Navy SEALs, there's a photograph that went around uh, of bin Laden dead. And AFP had prove, was able to prove that it was a fake image. But we didn't try to disseminate this because we felt it wasn't our role. And so that picture of a dead bin Laden is still uh, uh, spread on social media, and it's still considered uh, to be a proof uh, of his death on certain um, places. So there's been a change in stance uh, on our part. As of 2015, when we, kn when we realized that disinformation was now full and fledged part of delivering information, and that it could not simply have been seen as a marginal issue, as such, we um, leveraged resources in order to be able to conduct investigations on uh, fake information. And this is something that all media have done, you know, for example, to talk about Cambridge Analytica, about uh, Russian interference, uh, and also in order to, to try to put up, uh, implement fact-checking information. And again, fact-checking is when you check content that has been published by third parties. And there are a lot of images. It's a lot of uh, checking images, uh, videos, uh, and uh, just to, sh to ensure that these uh, images have not been uh, faked. So in, within the three years that have gone by, we have an editorial team of about uh, 1,800 uh, journalists. And so now we have about 100 journalists who are involved in this activity full time. They cover 150 countries. And they work in 23 different languages. AFP works generally in six languages. But for the fact checking, of course, it's important to be able to have the broadest reach possible and to go on online media. We need to speak uh, Burman, Filipino. We have to speak all sorts of different languages. And that's what we do. We endeavor to do this. And now we have become a key player in this fight against disinformation. And it's become. Um, a new uh, skill set for AFP, and we've acquired a certain experience in that. And I'd be quite pleased to talk about it more at length later, particularly in terms of talking about freedom of speech, because uh, I am in, I'll say it right away, I'm in complete disagreement with what I heard from our colleague from the United States. Uh, and also, I would like to just mention something else uh, in terms of what Chantal said. I have a much more positive vision uh, that you do. And I think that social media are a tool that can really free up uh, speech. It's an incredible tool to free up speech. And the problem is, is that it's uh, completely unregulated. We can talk about that later. tellement noir que je voulais quand même dire que y avait, y a, on, on est tous là à consulter pendant, parfois pendant le. I felt like you were giving such a dark table uh, description of it. Um, I just wanted to tell you. It's true that, of course, there is a lot of advantages and currents of thought that can express themselves that before they could not. Now, as far as uh, fake that you're talking about, fake news you're talking about, what is most astonishing to me is not the fake news. It's why so much indignation about it. When I was a student, we were told uh, day and night that the archipelago of Gulag was taken by CIA, that uh, Kravchenko was a liar, that Hitler, what have you, and nobody was uh, shocked about it. So is that the fruit of uh, networks? No, I think that the major difference versus the past, because disinformation always existed, the difference that is very simple is that today, m much global disruption was sporadic, accessible by a few number of people interested by Gulag. Today, it's massive, and it affects everyone. It's a drop by drop that is continuous. You were talking about the floods. Well, here you go. We flooded. Uh, yep, it's water. Mm -hmm. Now, so we will pursue this uh, debate, once everybody will uh, have a chance to speak, Richard, uh, please take the floor. No. Uh, 
I was just thinking about the things you were saying. It's not, when everyone talks about social media, it seems to me what they're really thinking is anti-social media, right? How unfriendly, how predatory, how pernicious social media is, and that it needs a wise, strong hand to reach out and to govern it and to make it tame. And certainly, um, Tame things can be useful, right? One does not want to ride a wild horse, for example. But the very act of taming something can also destroy it. What is social media? Social media is the crowd at the pub, the, the family around the dinner table, having a wide open conversation in which people can raise all sorts of unrelated topics. But at the proper dining room table in which maybe the boss has come to visit, the behavior of everyone at the table is very different. And everyone at the table knows there are things that you should not say. And even, if the, even that, there are words you should not use. So the question is, which of these two models do you want? Do you want the family dinner table, which a wide variety of opinions is possible, expressed in a wide variety of forms, that there is an acceptance that sometimes people will have an off day and say things that are not perfectly formed? Or do you want the formal dining room table in which the boss has come to visit and everyone is very, very careful and no difficult subject is discussed? As you're thinking about those two models, which might be more desirable for social media, the family table or the formal table. Think also <clears throat> that a very important decision is going to be made at the end of that dinner. Maybe it's a decision about life and death. Does that help you decide which of those two tables you want to sit at? The one where any subject can be, br be brought up, even the impolite ones? I submit to you that COVID is the one thing that's too important to censor. We should have every possible piece of fake information disseminated in the widest possible way. Why? So that the truth can also emerge. The truth emerges, as John Stuart Mill tells us, through its collision with error. We get a lively and more livelier and more vivid impression of the truth, Mill says on liberty, by, by colliding, colliding with and correcting error. If you keep the false statements out of the media, you never, you never create the drama that draws people in, and you also never present the counter arguments. There's an interesting piece of social media, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's called Quora, Q-U-O-R-A. And don't worry, I don't own a share of it, I'm not representing it. But this is a platform where you can just answer questions that other people have asked. And then the, the answers get ranked. What I find really interesting about Quora is when you look, go to its subject on politics, people are asking, what does the other side say about X? Why are they asking those questions? Because they don't encounter the other side, whatever side they're on, the other side, anywhere. Those subjects are not possible to raise. It's impolite to raise the other side. But still, there is a great curiosity about the other side and also a great fear. What if the other side is actually secretly correct and we are wrong? It is much better to present the error and let the other voices answer the error. Because it's very hard sometimes in advance to know what the error is. 10 years ago, we all thought we knew who Osama bin Laden was. We were very certain that many people, including people working for the New York Times, the Washington Post, were quite certain that he was suffering from kidney disease and on dialysis. We now know that wasn't true. For many years, maybe even to this day, people believe that he was funded by the CIA. No evidence of that whatsoever. 
So the experts, the gatekeepers, make mistakes too. It might be safer to live in a world without gatekeepers. Instead, in a world in which there are certain basic rules. Not rules about what kinds of information can be presented, but rules about how you treat people in the virtual world online, how you treat people that you disagree with. And maybe the reason why there's so much division and hatred in today's online discussions is because instead of making quiet and sober counter arguments, we shut them down as fake news. We condescend to them. We make accusations. Instead of just calmly asking for evidence and admitting, sometimes our evidence falls short too. And in this give and take, you'll find a more lively balance in society. But it does mean we would have to live in this absolutely terrible world in which sometimes people who disagree with us have something to teach us. Thank you. Merci, Richard. Thank you, Richard. In fact, what you're describing is the village and the gossip. The village and the level of the planet with the gossip that we're hearing when you live in a village. Often when people do not have details on an event, they're inventing them. I say people, us, of course, we're all like this. So it's a village on the scale of the planet. It's quite impressive and it raises a lot of questions. You're absolutely right uh, to mention them. Now, Jacob Siegel, we're going to hear you now. <clears throat> well, I think in the democratic spirit, I have found something to disagree with in every presentation so far. So, um, broadly speaking, I want to make two claims about social media and democracy. And the first is that the problem is not, uh, there is a problem. The problem is not social media in terms of the deleterious effects on democracy that we're all witnessing. The problem is real, but it's the digital economy and it's digital society. It's not social media per se, which is only uh, one manifestation of that much larger uh, and really epochal transformation that digital society represents. And then the second is social media is not uh, an attack on democracy, it's an attack on political elites. And it's attack, and an attack on institutional expertise uh, and institutional authority. So to come back to something uh, Chantal said in her opening remarks, I, I would agree with the characterization um, that you know it's a, a forum in which anybody, regardless of their qualifications, can say anything. And that produces legitimately destabilizing and at times, um, I think, dangerously destabilizing effects. But it's not contra democracy. I mean, that is, in a sense, a, a surplus of a kind of unchanneled democracy. It's, uh, it's not necessarily positive at all times, but it's not undemocratic for everybody to be able to speak whenever they want to speak. Um, obviously, you know, one of the, the insights Tocqueville offers is uh, these contradictions between the relentlessly egalitarian demands of American democracy, the relentlessly leveling demands of American democracy and political authority. And we're seeing some of that play out now. To substantiate my claim uh, about the effects of social media, I want to recount briefly some of the history of how this has been framed. So we all hear social media as an attack on democracy, and it seems so obvious that perhaps it has the quality of a kind of sociological or historical observation. But actually, it's a political claim. And the way you can understand that's a political claim is just by going back 10, 15 years 
and looking at how uh, social media and democracy were being discussed in the late aughts, uh, really in Obama's second term, which is when social media was introduced on a mass scale, how was it being talked about then? In glowing terms, social media, Twitter was the key uh, to what were going to be popular uprisings in Iran that were finally going to overthrow the regime in Iran. Twitter was going to be uh, ushering in a new flowering of democracy across the world. If you go back to the Arab Spring, you'll recall that Twitter in press accounts, certainly in the US, I don't know how this was characterized in France at the time, but in the US, almost universally, the opinion among the kind of bien passant, uh, excuse my French, I'm hoping that's close enough, you know what I mean, the right thinking people thought that uh, that not only was Twitter instrumental to the Arab Spring, but that it was a new model of how democracy was going to work. Who thought this at the time? Well, Hillary Clinton, for one, thought this at the time. And uh, President Obama thought this at the time. The 2008 re-election of Obama was known, self-described, uh, as the first Facebook campaign. So. Facebook was seen at the time as being uh, you know, an instrument of democratic progress. And in reality, the Obama administration became the Google administration uh, in a lot of ways in terms of the, the kind of merger of state and corporate power um, that happened during his presidency. But in the initial campaign period, it was the incredible effect of Facebook as an organizing tool and as a, a kind of instrument of democratic progress. Um, you know, this was a, a widely held view, okay, that social media was, in general, of course there were some negative effects, but that in general, social media was a democratizing instrument, that it was a, a, an instrument of political progress. All of this change is, you know, not unsurprisingly, around 2015, 2016, with Brexit, Donald Trump, and this larger uh, populist wave that seems to be spreading not only in the US but across the Western world. And so to take one example, you know, the Clinton campaign decides that Facebook is why they lost the 2016 election. And this narrative gets consolidated almost immediately after the election is over. There's, uh, and we can review the evidence, I think that there are some uh, fallacies that have persisted, but there's no evidence for that. The effect of the uh, you know, Russian uh, ad buying operations, et cetera, which are repeatedly brought up, are negligible. It's less than $100,000 that's spent. Uh, you know, Facebook is not, it's not just that it didn't cost Clinton the election, its impact in the election to include Cambridge Analytica, which got litigated in British courts. And what it, it turns out to take Cambridge Analytica as one example is they vastly overstated what they could do. This is what the British courts found when they, they spent years looking at the case of Cambridge Analytica. These claims about you know, this advanced psychometric technology where you could influence mass behaviors and harvest the data and get people to vote for who you want. No, actually they couldn't do anything of the sort. Um, they could do very damaging things and social media in general can do very damaging things but it doesn't have that kind of pinpoint precision power. So that's the kind of historical arc. Um, and I think that uh, Chantal, you mentioned Martin Gurry's book. It's a, an excellent book. I believe the title is uh, the Revolt Against the Elites is, uh, Martin Gurry is a former CIA officer. He wrote this book in either 2014 or 2015, so right before all of this happened. And basically what Gurry describes is um, the onset of, uh, we had been living arguably in an information economy prior to social media, but the digitization of everything creates a kind of flood of information that is utterly unmanageable and is not principally a political phenomenon. 
you know, the people to look to, to, to I think, understand uh, what this is, people like Marshall McLuhan. It's, it's people who are looking at information ecosystems. It's, it's not, social media does not represent a kind of narrowly political phenomenon. It's a uh, radical transformation of not only political economy, but also the basis of social organization. So the other thing that Guri points out, though, is that the view in the CIA prior to social media is that the public, insofar as such a thing was acknowledged, was a kind of amorphous and rather negligible uh, part of the population. So in other words, in evaluating as a CIA case officer, for instance, what actions should be taken in a particular country, what the uh, posture of the United States should be. The idea that the public opinion in the US should be taken into consideration was, it, you couldn't call it laughable because it didn't come up. There wasn't a public to be concerned with in that sense. What social media does is to, to take what appears to be a public and to make it uh, not only um, to give it not only a kind of unrestricted access to the political conversation um, and to policy questions, but also to give it this this socially generative force that we're still coming to terms with. So I have no idea how close to ten minutes I am, but I'll I'll try and make a, a few uh, concluding remarks. Um, <clears throat> I think the idea that we can look at social media either as a a family dinner table or a, a formal, call it a business meeting, is misleading in the sense that even if, as I am, you are in favor of the maximal degree of freedom of speech, and even if, as I am, you're in favor of allowing error and preferring uh, to admit error into a conversation than to try and regulate it out of all conversations, information monopolies are, are not like, uh, that's not my family. Um, digital technology monopolies. It's, it's more like, would you rather be at a table in a feudal manner where you're a serf who is permitted a, a wide range of topics to discuss, or would you rather be in a kind of uh, more directly authoritarian political environment? I, I don't see um, achieving greater free speech on social media platforms is beneficial in and of itself without more fundamental changes to the organization. Um, for instance, to, to be specific, the problem with Twitter is not just its censorship, which I, I can't remember who brought up the, the Hunter Biden stuff, but I couldn't agree more. The Twitter censored New York Post, one of the oldest newspapers in America, founded by Alexander Hamilton, produced reporting that was um, politically undesirable and was censored out of existence during the election. You could not read this insofar as Twitter would, would, uh, could manage it, Facebook included. Um, that is an unprecedented level of intervention into the American political system, absolutely unprecedented. And it doesn't just represent Twitter, you know, uh, taking greater powers unto itself. It represents a dangerous merger of corporate and, and uh, party interests, let us say. Um, so, but, but that being said, the problem with Twitter is not just the censorship. It's an advertising model and an algorithmic intervention into the social space, distinctly unlike the way a family works that rewards certain kinds of mob behaviors um, that is predatory as much of the kind of surveillance-based capitalism is predatory. So in conclusion, um, social media bad, but not for the reasons you think necessarily. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. <clears throat> of course. Of course, um, the media is an attack against the elites. But it doesn't exclude the fact that it could still be an attack against democracy such as we know it. Uh, democracy isn't just mudslinging. Um, 
Chesterton said with his uh, uh, irony, he said, who, is, who do you fall in love with? Somebody who has a runny nose or somebody who has a clean nose? But a bog standard citizen uh, is also able, as well as an elite intellectual, to know whether he should collaborate it, uh, under Nazi occupation or not, for example. So sometimes, well, this is my impression, sometimes the, the media, these social media, maintains people boxed into their own reality and imperils democracy. So perhaps I hand over to you, Mr. Fries, because I think you have something to say to Jason. Well, what's of, of interest, of course, is to have an American perspective and a European perspective. Um, the Americans uh, are harbingers of uh, freedom, but also these platform CEOs. Jack Dorsey often says that he represents the most extreme wing of the party for free freedom of speech. You know, when, when you see it from Europe, that kind of stance, how can I put it? It's like, uh, it's a bit trite um, for drumming up business, basically. I mean, it's just business mongering. And that's part and parcel of these platforms' uh, business model. The First Amendment, uh, we know that it safeguards uh, freedom of speech. And it allows you to do things that for a European are completely mad. And uh, recently, the Supreme Court authorized the fact that uh, f families of deceased in combat, because they were homosexual, they could be uh, mudslinged at on, platform, on the platforms. Uh, up until 2020, uh, negationism of the, of the Holocaust was allowed on uh, Facebook. And for the very reason that is dear uh, to Stuart Mill, that you have to have a freedom of conflict between ideas and the good ideas at the end of end, end of the day will will emerge. That's the American perspective. The European perspective is pretty similar to what you see uh, in economics. There is no perfect competition. There are abuses that you need to regulate, and uh, because of that, in Europe, we have safeguards, checks and balances. Not everything is possible. French law going to the freedom of the press limits scope for abuses. You can't deny the existence of the Holocaust in France, and I think that's good. And, you know, once again, I reiterate the idea to say that the good ideas will prevail and topple the bad ideas. Well, you'd like to believe it. But, you know, reality is not that, is it? Um, you know, you were quoting the pandemic, weren't you? You were referring to that. But a quarter of content circulating on social media are toxic. And this ends up by weighing down on public decisions. We've seen that in France. Is that what you want? How would you define toxic? Who defines the word toxic? Well, toxic, uh, well, I mean, it's fake news, basically. Sorry, but, you know, I don't know why you'd let... Well, before I say that, there's another point that's important because it's said that this is all about freedom of speech, but you know, freedom of, of speech is not the free freedom to use algorithms to drown out everything else. And the big difference with the social media is that those who ha were just talked at coffee uh, in a coffee shop, what they say is potentially accessible for the entire globe. And that's a radical sea change. You know, do you want to live in that type of society? I mean, uh, once again, uh, this is what's of interest. I think there are uh, certain uh, well, very conflicting views. You know, freedom of, of expression and freedom of speech in the US, and that, as it's understood in Europe, there are a bit of loggerheads. Um, you know, in light of everything that we see today, I think that you know, we have to defend our model. Uh, this is what the European Commission endeavours to do through its, um, its regulatory practices to regulate, which are consistent with the European thinking. But there's also censorship in the US, isn't there? You know, and Jason is railing against that. That's censorship. Well, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll put it differently. You know, 
My position is this. Toleration pushed to an extreme. Perhaps this will be a shock for some people. But toleration going to an extreme uh, plays into the hands of the intolerant. You know, it, this brings us back to uh, uh, the banishing of Trump, if you will, on the social platforms. I'm saying, thank God he was pushed out of the social uh, forum. The platforms were entitled to act as they did. It, they acted legitimately. The problem is it came too late in the day. The problem is, is that, what, two or three individuals, billionaires in California, who basically uh, snap their fingers, uh, they do what the tribunals and the courts couldn't do for years. You know, these platforms were so laxist and inactive that we arrive at this silly decision between just laissez-faire, uh, lasted for years, and banishing the most powerful person in the world from all social media. But it's the platforms, uh, these social media platforms, that put us I in front of that and throws up vast, rough reams of questions. But we've arrived at this point. Why? Well, because... You know, these calls for rebellion made by President Trump ended up with deaths. You tend to forget that. Um, the problem of all that is that you had to put barriers up very early. As early as 2015, Donald Trump um, made remarks against Muslims that should have been forbidden. The, the social media, Twitter, Facebook, let him speak by virtue of newsworthiness because you know it's to the public interest he was let he, he was allowed to speak and then we arrived at this uh, nefarious situation where he was banished but that was the last ditch attempt i mean the media uh, platforms were very happy with him speaking because trump had millions of followers and draws advertising revenue and that's basically what it all boils, boils down to I'm sitting behind all these uh, hand-waving about uh, freedom of speech. You often see economic interests that are rather vile, in my view. All, all right, then. Perhaps we'll hear from Jason first. <clears throat> People of France have social media to be able to push back against the AFP. Um, uh, look, what you gave was a, a beautiful presentation of your political beliefs. And I, I think that is excellent. I think that that's the reason why social media exists. Now, if I wanted to pick a fight, we could talk about the head of a news agency being that opinionated. But here's a, we're, we all have our political beliefs. And that's just the way uh, to say that, I mean, maybe Zuckerberg doesn't have a political belief because he might be a robot. But everybody has actual political, like it's something that's inherent in the human nature. And I think that we have to have that ability to push back, to challenge the elites. Uh, for somebody to, uh, the way that I hear people effectively being described is the unwashed masses. You know, how dare, how dare these rubes have an opinion? Uh, how, how dare they uh, pretend to, to know what's going on? Uh, look, uh, I know from reading, and we could go back and check uh, the mainstream media, and, um, and by no means, when I, if I criticize the AFP, I'm not saying that they're the level of CNN and the, uh, the fakery of news. But the, how much time was spent wasted on the Russia investigation or the Russia collusion? Well, in fact, there was no collusion with Russia uh, in 2016. But that was something that was perpetrated in the mainstream media as being a case of fact. Here's the reality. We need social media to be able to push back against the elites, to be able to push back against uh, the institutions, to make sure that, because nobody is ever right 100% of the time, there must be this freedom of expression, the ability to go and, and push back. Uh, otherwise, uh, who is determining uh, who's right and who's not? Nobody's, I mean, even take a look at history books. Who writes the history books? People who win. I'm sure you could say in almost uh, anyone, uh, you know, in, in any war, for example, if they're on the losing side, uh, could say, uh, we're upset with your description of saying that, uh, uh, that we lost, our people were, were slaughtered, when in reality, they just lost the war. But who determines that? Uh, uh, one side. And so I think you have to, you have to be able to get the, the viewpoints of, of the people uh, because none of us, uh, only one person can really say uh, who's right or not. And I don't think that's any of us uh, here on this earth. If I could just, um, Merci, uh, Richard, vous voulez parler. Thank you, Richard, over to you. Thanks. One, I hear exactly what you're saying. It would be a better world in which people didn't um, question the existence of the Holocaust. 
However, let's try and learn from some history, especially some European history. In 1920, the SPD saw in, in Germany, seeing radical movements, decided to start limiting what newspapers could say, what could be said on broadcasts. In 1924, famous Beer Hall Putsch, an insurrection led by the new uh, National Socialist German Workers Party, now known as the Nazis, uh, tried to take over the government uh, in one of the German Landa. They were arrested and the SPD enacted more and more sweeping censorship restrictions in 1927, in 1928, and finally in 1929. 1933, Hitler comes to power. In 1934, the SPD, which is now being censored, complains bitterly and says, what about our free speech rights? What about our rights to say what we think about this regime? And Hitler laughs at them and says, we cried out for free speech for 10 years and you condescended to us and you looked down upon us and you told us we were liars and we were beneath contempt and you expect pity from me now. This is what he said on the floor of the Reichstag in 1934. Every rule you construct can be used against you later. Power is not permanent, it is ephemeral. Every time you want to ban the Holocaust, they could ban something else. They could be forbidden to talk about vegetarianism or veganism, right? If the power dynamic switches. Always when constructing rules, imagine you are the person who will suffer, not the person who will decide how those rules will be applied. Just my thought. Yeah, moi, je peux répondre? Can I answer? Yes. You have to protect democracy against itself. I mean, I think it's right that democracy protects itself against people who quite obviously uh, run off into the arms of totalitarianism and would be opponents to democracy. I see no problem whatsoever. Uh, the interdiction of the Nazi party or maybe the Communist Party being forbidden on American soil. That doesn't bother me. But what does bother me, if somebody is entering the, the public forum and the political uh, forum, just like footballers, for example, somebody is allowed on the field and he's never given the ball. This is what happens with Le Pen in France. And I don't agree with that. I think you can forbid people who appear uh, dangerous. Of course, it's difficult to know what dangerousness is, and you might disagree with that characterization. But anyway, you need to allow people to play with the ball. Did you want to speak? Is that right? Who wanted to take the floor? Well, I, d I don't want to mon monopolize, but just very simply for me, and just to, to return to uh, the Holocaust, it's not an opinion in Europe. It's a fact. So there's no discussion. <laughs> Um, but what I would agree with both of you, I, mean, I don't want you to give you the impression that we, our, our position is such that we're defending an elitist uh, perspective or, or being with authority per se, talking about mainstream media and not only social media. You know, mainstream media also have a responsibility in everything that we've seen over the last few years. You know, mainstream media didn't see uh, the arrival of Trump didn't see Brexit coming. Why? Well, because it's true. Um, they had lost touch with the grassroots reality. So what answer can we give to that? Well, first, I think we need to deploy troops, if you will, media troops in areas that have been deserted by journalists, the northern reaches of the um, uh, UK in the Rust Belt of America, and this is what's difficult for a press agency to show or to present information in an honest, impartial way. Of course, it's difficult. I'm not saying that we ever achieve it, but this is what's lacking, I think, from some media, and in particular online media. And we know, uh, basically, before they post, what their post is going to be. So we need to be responsible. But to say these mainstream media or well, there's been a major change with social media. You know, those who were the uh, gatekeepers of information, you said it was the, the, the rulers. And I was a bit struck because it's really 
the journalist. It was a journalist who decided what would be the public conversation and, and ranked uh, uh, and ordered the, 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 the themes that were going to be discussed by the nation. But they, those days are over. It's over now. Journalists uh, have taken that on board. Now everything is on the social network. But the social networks are not responsible for their content, the content that they broadcast. And that's the major difference. There's the ontological difference and the rules-based difference. And that's where my divergence lies. I think there needs to be rules. I'm not talking about censorship. You know, I'm not talking about rolling out censorship. I think we need the basic rules of the game that you may not look kindly upon. But I fear that we might have economic underlyings that are stoking the fires, basically, for what's posted on these, on these uh, uh, forums. Would you like saying a last word? Um, so the, the idea that there is a, a choice to be made, excuse me, uh, between kind of uh, populist critique and, and institutional authority, I think ultimately will prove to be a false choice. It's unsustainable. Complex modern societies do not run without elites of some kind. Um, they degenerate um, into varying forms of chaos, absent some kind of institutional authority. So the balancing act is between democratic representation on the one hand and competent elites on the other who are responsive to the national polity in a way that generates uh, trust and legitimacy. Unfortunately, that's lacking now, which creates this, uh, again, what I think is a false choice between uh, a kind of populist critique, which might be, can be more or less useful uh, momentarily, but is volatile and often degenerates into unreason, um, and a, uh, an institutional elite in America in particular that's done a tremendous job of systematically discrediting itself for the last three decades and isn't going to all of a sudden reconstitute its authority by determining that it will be the ultimate fact checker on uh, social media. To bring this back to political economy for a second, I think the, the question of the relationship between mainstream journalism, social media, democracy is important. Basically, there is no, uh, there is no uh, army to be deployed along the model that you've suggested in the US anymore because newsrooms, the journalism industry in America is gone. It doesn't exist in the same way anymore. So all of that local civil society that Tocqueville found so essential to the American character is gone. And journalism is one leading indicator of that. The concentration, the consolidation of journalism in coastal cities and in DC has uh, radically changed the field. You can see this both in terms of local reporting, local newspapers, something like 50% of which have disappeared uh, just in the last two decades. And you can see it even in foreign reporting. The foreign desks are gone also. So the ability to go out and report on these things is gone. In the absence of that, what you get is more and more kind of top-down uh, narrative, uh, you know, a kind of narrative editorializing that uh, social media then presents itself as the uh, antidote to. So you have this kind of, uh, in the absence of, you know, genuine fact-based reporting, you have the kind of national newsrooms. The New York Times is a great example of this. The New York Times, uh, they had a, an editorial meeting, um, I forget when it was, it was last year, and, and famously, just to summarize it quickly, Dean Banquet, the editor-in-chief of the New York Times, is initially calling for a kind of um, responsible, uh, traditional model of journalism, and he's, um, he's called out by various members of the staff of the New York Times. The, the notes got leaked, so this became public, who are insisting on a more... Um, ideologically uh, active editorializing approach to journalism as the only way to do responsible journalism. So that's the institutional authority. Social media then presents itself, uh, you know, sometimes usefully, sometimes insanely, as the kind of antidote to that. But what's lost is any actual civil society, which is what a democracy needs, and social media is not going to fix that and uh, newsrooms aren't going to fix that 
by dictating from on high that they're going to do something that they can't practically implement because they've been so hollowed out. Merci. Vous voulez dire un mot? Non, juste parce que ce qui est well, I don't think that uh, French audiences are actually uh, aware uh, necessarily of what has been happening in the United States. Because we always hear what's happening in the United States is going to happen here in a few years. So what's happening in the United States is that there's a, a rather deep running crisis of journalism. And uh, local journalism is gradually vanishing. You know, 50% of local uh, newspapers that have disappeared. And then the other half, uh, the remaining 50%, is now owned by investment funds. And so they're not investing in it because they believe in journalism. They're using these uh, remaining uh, outlets as communication tools, influence tools. And so that's uh, really a little bit horrific. And so here we're in the home of Tocqueville, and you can see what that means for local democracy to such an extent that Facebook, is, and it's just a paradox, Facebook, uh, has contributed to the crisis of local journalism. But today, uh, uh, Facebook is supporting local project because they don't have enough information at the local level to uh, inject into their network. It's just crazy. Thank you. Thank you to all four uh, members of the round table. And I'd like to pass the mic to somebody in the audience who would like to ask a question. Hello, thank you. Democracy Initiative. And I'd actually like to ask about disinformation. You know, we spoke a lot about it on a philosophical level, but I feel like the conversation really focused as though we were talking in this room amongst one another where each of us more or less can have an equal voice and, you know, truth and untruth can balance each other out. Of course, on social media, that's not exactly how that works. On social media, you have algorithms. And these algorithms, advance things that are the most outrageous, that are the loudest, that are the least nuanced. The phrase that I think is American originally, uh, that uh, you know, a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth has even gotten its pants on, has never been more true. And social media makes that infinitely worse. So what we're talking about is not freedom of speech per se, but the very fact that lies and disinformation are actually significantly advantaged on social media. You know, there's um, a, a, a prominent uh, a Trump advisor, Stephen Bannon, who said, and as we would say in, in English, pardon my French, uh, flood the zone with shit, which is exactly what's happening on social media. And I'm sorry to say on, on Getter, for example, uh, misinformation about the election is rampant, it's everywhere. The fact that Joe Biden won the election would be news, I imagine, to a significant percentage of people on the platform. And what I guess I want to ask is, it's, it's again, not so much a question of free speech, but what responsibility, if any, does media and do these platforms have to try to, I suppose, uh, at the very least, limit some measure of disinformation? Thank Let you. Let me try and answer that by pointing to what they're already doing. Oui, oui. Uh, oui, je, je... Yes, uh, thank you, sir. So this question, uh, how do you detect what a lie is? Uh, how do you define a lie? Because on social media, something looks like a lie, but it actually turns out to be a truth. And leaders, world leaders lie a lot too. We had a minister of health here in France who told us that masks were pointless. So that's the problem. You can't simply say uh, that everything that comes out of social media is a lie. So it's very complex. Uh, which, who would like to answer that? This is the approach that's been taken. So the idea that there's no attempt to regulate disinformation uh, or what's characterized as disinformation is not accurate in terms of the way these platforms are behaving now. So if you look at YouTube, which is a subsidiary of Google, for instance, they have a disinformation policy concerning COVID that states that anything that contravenes the, uh, anything that contravenes World Health Organization policy is disinformation and is, uh, can be removed. And in fact, the way they implement this uh, typically is by not providing any explanation for something that they've removed and providing no meaningful recourse or appeal. But if you look at the positions the World Health Organization has taken since the start of the pandemic, that the disinformation criteria could have applied to 
wearing masks, as people have pointed out repeatedly, it also could have applied to characterizing COVID as extremely infectious. So if in you know, April of 2020, you had said COVID is extremely infectious, that would have qualified as disinformation according to the uh, criteria established by Google and would have been removed from YouTube. Twitter's policy is almost the same. Now, I bring that up not to say that uh, there shouldn't be any regulation. I, I agree with uh, the, I know it was discussed yesterday, I missed it, but you know, I think the idea that uh, these platforms are simply publishers who have no responsibility is an absurd uh, and they should be subject to antitrust regulation. That being said, when you are deferring to authorities who are themselves uh, continually proven to be wrong and you don't have a transparent process for reviewing this stuff, the approach to disinformation that gets implemented, practically speaking, is just uh, deference to blind authority. So it's not that it doesn't exist, that's what it is now. It might not be uh, applied to everybody's satisfaction, you might wanna see more of a certain kind of information censored, less of another kind, you know, you might disagree, but there is a disinformation policy and that's what it is. And I, I don't think that it has been uh, wisely implemented, and nor has it been um, subject to any kind of meaningful review. Merci. Thank you. We have another question. I'm a university teacher, Françoise. I have a question for Fabrice. Uh, he wet our appetite by talking about the necessary uh, regulations. And so apparently there's no agreement amongst you about what might be that form of regulation and what could be a legal, uh, legal approach. For example, I was working with somebody whose reputation was destroyed by unjustified attacks on social media. So what type of regulation might be put in place for that type of situation? And now I have another question for Jacob, who said that the Tocquevillian model uh, was no longer in existence in the United States, which I readily believe. But the damage is about the whole timeline of democracy. We've talked about public discussion, deliberation in democracy. And so uh, deliberation and discussion on Twitter is quite uh, tricky. So what happens to democracy when it's all about speed and, and, and the, the, the speed of social media, which does not uh, lead to uh, constructive deliberation? Uh, oui, Yes, in terms of regulations, um, it's difficult to bring in rules. It's difficult to talk about that uh, right away. So uh, it's easy to regulate illegal content, and, and there are certain laws uh, that are being reviewed at the European level, the Digital Services Act, which uh, aims at accelerating the situation in order to compel platforms to act and to uh, comply, because some of the obstacles is that platforms don't always cooperate. The problem is this doesn't really cover all content in the so-called gray area, and this is what we've been talking about here. And this means that there's a human judgment that's being made, and the laws, uh, and here I agree with my American friends, laws are, can be very dangerous in, the con in this context because it's very difficult to uh, make laws about the freedom of expression. And there are so many anti-fake laws, new uh, laws that are actually tools of repression. If we look at Singapore, Hungary, and Poland, and this can be very dangerous. So when we talk about regulating, it's also about self-regulation on the part of platforms. There's a parallel uh, when we talk about combating climate change. It's a similar situation. We're seeing the wave that's about to come, and then you tend to get used to it, like we get used to flooding and fires, and so now we're used to, to historical uh, events being rewritten uh, based on conspiracy theories. We, we're accustomed to the spread of uh, disinformation, and we feel powerless. But I think we could really look at what's being done in the area of combating climate change. First of all, platforms need to really focus on what's most polluting. 65% of the fake news that uh, has been spread about the pandemic have actually been generated by 12 people. 
these conspiracy theorists, they're not thousands of them. There's a very small fringe of individuals who are millionaires. Some of them are in France, uh, Casas Novas, De Johnny. So let's go and get those guys, and, uh, and the law can uh, take care of them. The, uh, and so that's what we need to focus on, those small number of conspiracy theorists. Um, also, within climate change, there's what they call the precautionary principle. Perhaps platforms should apply this to themselves. They've launched uh, products on the market, but they haven't tested them. And the pharmaceutical industry would never do this, or the air industry would never do that. But after, so what happens is that uh, social media realize that this leads to the attack on the capital and the murder of the Rohingya. So what they should do is they should test their products before they launch them on the market. And when they realize that there are negative effects, they should correct them. They always say that uh, technology will change the world. Well, that's their playing field. They could put something to slow down information. And th th this happens on the, on the road when you're driving. And also in terms of uh, climate change, there's something that's known as uh, whoever pollutes pays. And so uh, the platforms, platforms who pollute, and they're not the only polluters. Uh, social media are not the only, uh, are not the only ones uh, who should be blamed. But so um, they need to put into thing into place systems, fact checking, moderation. The the massacre of the Ringos. It was demonstrated that there was only one moderator on uh, Google who spoke. Uh, Burmese, and uh, this person was in Dublin, and so that's why Facebook let these hate speech proliferate about the Rohingyas. And so uh, uh, platforms need to pay to implement uh, proper methods, and then they also need to have an impact on the entire ecosystem, as with climate change. There's something that would be very easy to take on. For example, disinformation states, uh, they rely on ads to survive. 2.6 billion is poured in on, into these uh, disinformation, disinformation sites. And this is because uh, what we call progr programmatic ads. Before, when an ad advertiser wanted to put out an ad, they did media planning, and the advertiser selected the media that would uh, target the best uh, audience. And so, for example, they'd go onto the Figaro magazine, if they wanted something for the so-called elite classes. But uh, now we have automatic adding ads, and so the advertiser doesn't know where their ads are being shown. And, and so sometimes it targets uh, an audience that's on a disinformation uh, site, which is just a bait-clicking area for sensation, sensationalist news. So advertisers should no longer uh, tolerate that. They need to take back the control, and they need to stop having their ads appear on those types of sites. So there can be entire conferences that are spent with hand-wringing and pearl-clutching about this. But there are things that we can be done against this. For example, if we talk about Hunter Biden, um, there is a certain interpretation that was provided of, of censorship. But I'd like to provide another interpretation. And that is to say that media, perhaps the mainstream media, uh, you could say this is a collusion of the elite, but they, haven't, they didn't take this seriously. They saw that this was uh, somewhat fake, and they didn't want to. They didn't want to have a remake of what happened with the theft of uh, Hillary Clinton's emails, and so they didn't even advertise it. And so the thing just, you know, died out on its own. So there's no miracle solution in terms of combating disinformation. Everybody needs to play their part. Companies need to play their parts. So Renault, Nissan, they need to be careful about the types of ads that can end up on a neo-Nazi website. Uh, we need to put pour money into this, and that's how we'll get there. That's that's fake news. That is absolute fake news. And for a member of the press corps to sit up in front of an audience and actually perpetrate fake news, I think is is quite disturbing. The Hunter Biden laptop is real. Everything in there is real, and that is that's not fake news. And the fact that Twitter and Facebook went and actually suppressed uh, the information, would not let the, the get that out. And uh, look, Fabrice, I understand that you have a very much let them eat cake attitude when it comes to free speech. Like, oh, we elites can have one thing, but uh, you know, the, the unwashed masses slowing down information. This, again, is why people don't trust the media. This is why people become so frustrated. When For you to sit up here and actually talk about fake news, I think it's pretty disturbing.
Hold on, wait. I, we're one of the news organizations well, that good. actually got the Hunter Biden email. I can tell you two things that have never been reported. One, okay, we actually got the Hunter Biden emails, all right? He didn't leave one laptop. He left three at a computer repair store run by an albino, half-legally bl blind guy in a, near, a few steps from his apartment in Wilmington, Delaware. That hard drive, which is actually three hard drives, is a 10-year image of everything that he did on his iPad, his iPhone, and all of his computers. 10 years of financial records, and anything connected to his cloud, including the, the, his wife, his wife's uh, daughter, etc. right? All independently verifiable information. We had an FBI forensics expert go through it at great length. And I can tell you this, at the press conference in which the Delaware uh, repair store guy spoke, no one asked him basic journalistic questions. How did this come into your possession? Do you still have the video camera security tape of Hunter himself showing up drunk with the three computers? They didn't ask basic factual questions. They asked him, who are you gonna vote for? Do you speak Russian? Journalists weren't trying okay. to gather factual questions from him. They weren't acting as journalists. Je crois, je crois they were acting as advocates. And Pardon. this is why people can no longer tell the difference between what you and I do, which is serious journalism, and the bloggers and the social media people. Because too often, mainstream reporters act worse than bloggers and social media people. Richard, merci. Je vais, je donne la parole à... Thank you. Now I'm going to give the floor to Jacob, who's going to wrap things up, because after this, we will need uh, to stop this. And I know there are lots of other questions, but there's another question from Mrs. Melinio was given that social media rewards speed and has been uh, destructive of civil society, what happens to democracy. Um, I don't know. I, I'm uh, not a great prognosticator. I, I try to just pay attention to what's observable now. And what I can say about the present situation is that I think that social media, um, it absent real economic regulation, there won't be any meaningful social intervention. So I think that the, the problems that are most urgent that need to be addressed now are mostly at the level of political economy. So it seems like maybe it's not as grand and as resonant with uh, themes of, of democracy that feel more meaningful, but to me, the, the most important thing would be something like giving people ownership of their own data. And that uh, reforms, and, and some of what the EU is doing, I think, is actually in terms of like the, the right to, I forget how it's phrased, the right to be forgotten. Um, some of these are good. Curtailing the power of these uh, digital surveillance instruments is the only way to clear the space necessary to allow any kind of reconstitution of uh, a local culture. What we have now, a kind of global information system, the word, uh, phrase global village uh, reminds me of what Marshall McLuhan said, which is, you know, basically a global village is, is world war, is what a global village amounts to. Because for biological evolutionary reasons, anthropological reasons, spiritual reasons, any that you want to name, we weren't made to live in global societies. It's, it's not possible, it drives us insane, we turn into um, crazy people. So um, to get back to anything resembling a kind of local character in society where there are civic institutions that can meaningfully constrain this stuff without the state having to step in, you have to first reform the digital economy to make that possible. Thank you very much. My, th my friends, we have to stop. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Some gentleman asked the floor for some uh, minutes. If we can pass the floor to him, please. A mic. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Timothée Dufour. We did present social networks on an angle that was quite negative, creating a division. However, I want to give a drop of hope, and I want to have your example, giving you a counter example, since we focus on Twitter and F Facebook. There's another social network 
that is Wikipedia, and that is Encyclopedia. I'm a lawyer, I don't work for them. Why is this social network a success and allowed, to go back on the expression of Fabrice Fries, uh, to make out the good news come from the top? Jason Miller, Facebook page. Tonight, anybody can go on Wikipedia uh, page and add on Jason Miller, at, participate to the conversation of Tocqueville on September 21. Tomorrow morning, there was Epstein, who had a brilliant debate with uh, Jason, said, no, I don't agree. He didn't attend the conversation. I cross out this reference. Jason, the Monday morning, wakes up in Washington and said, no, no, no. They crossed that out. I was there. That's a fact. So he's going to read a, a Figaro article in law that echoes his prestation. He's going to add on his own page. Jason did participate to the conversation with a source to the article of law. Wikipedia, therefore, created a debate. There was an add-on of an information that was crossed out and added on again and accepted by Wikipedia because the source was there. So in my opinion, you can have the good news, the real information, top words, and Wikipedia is a good example for it. Do you agree with what I'm saying? I absolutely do not agree with you. A lot of uh, lies were told on me for family reason uh, on Wikipedia. I tried to suppress them. I was told you have to pay somebody full time to do it because they'll come back every minute. So I just absolutely disagree. I believe that it was true a few years ago. There was a famous episode about a French boss. Uh, his, his Wikipedia page started by J Jewish poll, and he had a lot of uh, problem cards like this. Today, Wikipedia is given as an example. It's not uh, social media. It's an online encyclopedia that could regulate itself. It's a sign of hope for all other platforms, but they have to get into it. They have to think and analyze, but they have to want it. So read a report from yesterday's Wall Street Journal that is showing that they do not have this desire and that the platforms, once again, I believe, are ticking in a sling, uh, the freedom of expression not to do anything because this is what supports their growth and their business model. And the article of Wall Street Journal is showing a listen of lies and uh, passivity that is completely full of will occur along the years because it's good for them and they, they dig it. And there's an excellent book from uh, a reporter called An Ugly Truth on the Facebook story that was quite successful and described carefully how the um, leaders did not want to deal with this issue, always put dust under the carpet be as they knew. And this is what is, uh, Wall Street is showing. They knew. They cannot say that they were taken by surprise. No, they knew it and didn't do anything. Well, Wikipedia should encourage them to grab this problem because it's possible. And once again, it's a general message that I want to convey. The disinformation, such as we know it, it's a recent phenomenon, 2015, let's say, not so long ago. Well, we have solutions appearing. There is a mobilization happening, and we must succeed. Let's go on. Do we still have time for a question, or should we stop? I'm asking the boss. The well, boss, Marie, I said, well, so thank you very much, my friends, but I think this is it. No, this is not it. If the chiefs are contradicting each other. So let's go on with the last question, then. Well, I have the mic, Patrick Deroville. I want this a question very simple, perhaps addressed to Mr. Minter, because I like the concept of family and not, uh, I like the concept of error that can be corrected, but should we spend our time on social networks in order to be capable of avoiding or to uh, do correct work to know how errors are corrected? If we have 25% of the uh, of chance to have a fake news, I thought it was more actually, I have the feeling that every time I have fake news, I'm stealing my capability of thinking. 
and this is detrimental to democracy. I cannot spend 10 hours of my day on social networks, nor do I want to. So as a human being today can spend his life or should spend his life on social networks to use them properly. Who wants to answer that? Let's think about what the majority of people do on social media. Most human beings on social media are not like the people in this room. They are exchanging photos of cats and dogs, children, new cars, uh, and food they've made in the kitchen. Right? The majority of social media communication is family-based communication, or broadly speaking, family, people you know. You're sending relatively intimate objects, a cake you've made, right? something that's personalized, a picture of your child um, you know, chasing the dog around the kitchen, something like this. right? That's how most people use social media. Now, into that conversation, people also inject things they're thinking about. Uh, and those include things that are also political or cultural. So when this debate occurs among intellectuals, we're very concerned about what political or cultural things are put into that stream of conversation about how to make a cake, where your nephew is going to university, what kind of job your niece is going to have, and all these kinds of things, right? And this seems very strange to ordinary people because they're just saying, oh, she's just having a straight thought. More than 25% of things that are shared on Facebook are not read before they are shared. People are just looking at the headline and sending it along, this looks funny. I think we have to realize that only a handful of people who are probably mentally not well balanced are consuming this conspiracy theory stuff. Most people are, are the even the political and cultural stories they're exchanging are um, cheap shots or quick little asides. Uh, you know, for example, you know, look at uh, Biden being booed at these football stadiums, for one. Or, ha ha, isn't it great that Trump has been banned from, from Facebook or social media? But most people are using these communications for very mundane things. And you know, I hear what Jason's saying. It's like, well, it's not a family conversation. But Facebook especially, not, maybe not so much Twitter, is for many people, ordinary users, a family conversation. It's, and it's also a way of reconnecting with people they went to university with or people they once dated or people in professional circles. LinkedIn is a bit like this too, right? That's more like the office water cooler, right? But we have to search for these metaphors so that it's clear what we're talking mm -hmm. about here. Merci, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Thank you all. Thank you to the four of you.